Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. In 2012, the Obama administration announced it would pivot to Asia. Yet, as President Obama's second term is coming to an end, many important issues in East Asia, and especially concerning North Korea, remain unchanged or may have even worsened since the Bush era. During the last six years, North Korea sank the South Korean Navy vessel Chonan, shelled Yongpyong Island, conducted two nuclear tests, and is probably closer than ever to becoming a full-fledged nuclear power. What has been the attitude of the White House towards North Korea since Obama came to power? What were the president's expectations towards Pyongyang at the start of his presidency? And can we expect further developments, or has the Obama administration reached its lame duck phase? To answer these questions, we had a short talk with David Sanger, the New York Times chief Washington correspondent. David Sanger has covered a wide variety of issues for the Times, with a focus on foreign policy, nuclear proliferation, and Asian affairs. He has reported from New York and Washington, and was the Times bureau chief in Tokyo for several years. Mr. Sanger was twice a member of Times reporting teams that won the Pulitzer Prize, and belonged to a team nominated for the prize in 2011 for their coverage of the tsunami and nuclear disaster in Japan. David Sanger is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Aspen Strategy Group. He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College in 1982. David Sanger, welcome to Korea in the World. Good to be with you. One year into his presidency back in 2010, President Obama announced the American pivot to Asia. Yet some commentators argue the only practical consequence so far has been those hundred, several hundred Marines restationed to Darwin in Australia. What is your view of the relationship between the rhetoric and the action when it comes to the pivot? Well, the rhetoric has certainly been a little bit uh, greater than what you've actually seen take place. And I, I think that there's a risk in focusing too much on the presence of people, ships, airplanes, although I'll get back to that mm -hmm. in just a moment, and instead focus on what's always the most important in any White House, which is mind share. So during the Bush administration, when I was White House correspondent for the Times, uh, there had been a big push by many around President Bush to focus on China very early, mostly in the way of, of figuring out a way to contain its power. And then 9-11 happened, and the Iraq War and the Afghan War, obviously, before that. Mm. By the time President Bush got around to dealing with China, it was merely in the area of its support for counterterrorism. So the result was that we saw during the Bush administration, and I wrote a lot about this in a book called The Inheritance, that Iraq, Afghanistan, wars that were going bad, ended up so dominating the mind share of uh, the Bush administration that they didn't really have the bandwidth to deal with Asia in a broad way. Now, that said, many of the relationships did fine. The relationship with South Korea, which had started off pretty poorly under uh, the late President No, ended up pretty strong under President Lee and, and President Bush. The relationship with Japan strengthened. And at that time, which were the last years of Hu Jintao, the relationship with China was at least non-toxic. Mm. But by the time that President Obama arrived, I think he and his national security advisor during the first term, Tom Donilon, had rightly concluded that the United States had greatly underinvested in Asia. And that didn't simply mean underinvesting in the presence of military, but had underinvested diplomatically, had not focused as much on the kind of trade agreements one would need, had not really focused on building up the alliances. They benefited soon after they announced the pivot from China's own aggressive activities on territorial issues which tended to drive many of the Asian countries more into the American camp. And mm -hmm. I think that's certainly been the case with South Korea and with uh, Japan. And to some degree, it's been the case with the Philippines, Vietnam, everybody else who's involved in a territorial dispute. The downside of this is that the Middle East, if anything, has gotten more complicated. The early hopes for the Arab Spring turned to bitter disappointment. 
the necessity to get an agreement with Iran on the nuclear issue occupied a huge amount of time. Secretary Kerry spent uh, the first year of his time in office in what turned out to be a fruitless effort to get a Middle East peace accord. And I think that there is reason at that moment for um, many people to question whether or not the follow-through has been as great as the early promise. And it's interesting, uh, President Obama and Secretary Kerry, they're sensitive to this critique. And I think that's part of why you've seen this year that Prime Minister Abe, President Park, and several other Asian leaders have all been invited to to the White House. Hmm. Is it reasonable to assume that President Obama had maybe different plans for the American policy towards Asia? It would have given Asia more attention if, again, the Middle East had not flared up, that there is some kind of an opportunity cost here. Well, there's certainly opportunity cost because there's limited resources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the place where Asia takes the largest part of the economic resource is in the concept of building up the naval presence. And our Navy right now is smaller than many would like to see it. Uh, I don't get as exercised about this as do some of President Obama's critics who point out that we haven't had this few ships since World War I. Well, thank you. One carrier group is capable of doing more than our entire Navy in World War I was. And it sort of ignores the question of technological capability. Our intelligence assets are much more efficient. But I think given what we've seen the Chinese doing in um, the Spratleys and uh, certainly in the dispute with Japan and what you've seen North Korea doing in the buildup of its nuclear program would certainly argue for focus at least on those two issues and how one would establish a, a reasonable turn. Uh, when Barack Obama became president, one of his big themes was to extend a hand to America's foes, assuming, and I quote, that they were w willing to unclench their fist. Uh, that was in his first inauguration speech. The rhetoric was primarily, I think, aimed at the Muslim world, but it did also target North Korea. It did. And if you think about that phrase in the uh, inaugural speech on January 20th, 2009, there were really four countries that I think he most had in mind. And uh, those were obviously Iran and North Korea, hmm. to a lesser degree, uh, Myanmar and Cuba. So let's run through the scorecard. On Myanmar, they made early progress. You can argue now that we're stuck with a regime there that has pursued a, a pretty nasty ethnic war. But certainly there was a degree of interaction with them that we've not seen before. Hmm. On Cuba, it took until just earlier this year for the president to announce his big initiative. But what I thought was striking was that by the time it was announced, the opposition to it in Washington was pretty feeble, and that wouldn't have been the case 10 years ago. There's a new generation. It is no longer death to a politician in Florida or New Jersey, hmm. the two places that have a significant Cuban population. Quite to the contrary, there's a generation that very much wants to open it up. And you just don't hear, even in the president, early presidential campaign or anything like that, you don't hear a whole lot of pushback on that. Mm. The problem with Cuba and Myanmar is they are strategically insignificant to the United States. Myanmar, former Burma, was last strategically vital during World War II and perhaps you could argue during the Vietnam War, uh, when it was, of course still a bit on the margins. Cuba was last strategically vital to us in 1962. That's the year after the president was born. So those two were relatively easy. Iran is the very hard nut to crack. I spend a lot of time writing and covering the Iranian nuclear negotiations. I think they will get a deal, but I'm not sure that it will necessarily lead on any time soon to a broader relationship with Iran. And the deal itself has got you know, many issues to it. North Korea has been the notable exception to the rule. The North Koreans fired off a nuclear test, their third in 2009, just a few months after the president took office. 
when new presidents come in, some countries send congratulatory cables, others make phone calls, a few send postcards, they shot off a nuclear test. It turned everybody in the White House, I think, almost without exception, in North Korea hawks. Mm. And essentially the policy has been pretty frozen since. Um, in your latest book from 2013, you mentioned that President Obama sent several secret letters to North Korea early in his first term. What might have been the contents and what was the result of these uh, secret tractations? You know, this was very much like the early letters that he sent Ayatollah Khamenei in uh, Iran. These were the early efforts to try to appeal to the better instincts of uh, these countries to sort of say, I meant what I, I said mm -hmm. in uh, the inaugural address. But... Of course, those went to Kim Jong-il, and uh, Kim Jong-il died, what, three years ago now. And uh, since that time, we have been seeing a consolidation of power by Kim Jong-un. He's had two tracks to this. He's had an economic reform track, but he has also had a track for building up his nuclear weapons. The U.S. is stuck in part because our policy is that North Korea must agree that the ultimate aim of the talks, if we resume conversation, is the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And nuclear weapons are built into North Korea's constitution. We have no indication that they have any interest in giving up their arsenal. And what's more, if you were in North Korea and you were looking around at the world that you see today, you could argue that we have created some incentives for them to keep their nuclear weapons. We took in Libya's nuclear weapons from Muammar Gaddafi in 2003-2004, made some brief efforts to reintegrate him, but as soon as the revolution inside Libya took off, we joined the effort to oust him. He was ultimately killed. If you're North Korean and you look at that, you must say, hmm. gee, maybe giving up his potential nuclear weapons complex, Gaddafi didn't have any weapons yet himself, he only had the equipment for it, maybe that wasn't the brightest idea. You could uh, argue that they look at the Iraq invasion and they would say if Saddam actually had reconstituted his nuclear weapons, which he hadn't, the United States would have thought twice about invading. Um, did Barack Obama truly believe when he entered uh, office that there might be a change and that it would be possible to resume talks with North Korea and possibly even solve some of the existing disputes? And was this maybe naive, as, maybe, uh, as many of the critics argued through his first term in office? Uh, they argue that there's no naivete toward it. I think they misjudged the speed at which Kim Jong-un would uh, consolidate power in recent years. The intelligence reports when Kim Jong-un first came in suggested that the military might not put up with him and so forth. Well, you know, he turned around and executed his uncle. And if you believe what you read in the papers just today, he's executed 15 people this year. So... You know, I think he came into this with the thought that there is no downside to trying. And actually, one of the things that I admire about the Obama foreign policy, and there is a lot to criticize, but one that I admire, is that he's basically taken the position, particularly with countries like Cuba and Myanmar, but to some degree with North Korea, that, look, we're the world's largest superpower. We spend more on our military than the next 10 countries combined. We spend four times more than the Chinese spend. We spend infinitely more than the Cubans, the Burmese, and the Iranians, and the North Koreans spend. So we can afford to take some chances here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the right attitude. Six years ago, you wrote uh, about North Korea that Bush took a messy, dangerous problem and made it worse. So what's your one-sentence verdict for Barack Obama? Um, just recently, we, we heard that North Korea might have 20 nuclear warheads in the near future. Or more, depending Or more, on who yeah. you believe, yes. Uh, and I've spent some time here just trying to get my arms around those numbers, and it's, it's difficult to do because it's all based on different assumptions. So let's go back to the quotation. Mm -hmm. The George Bush took a messy situation in North Korea and made it worse. He made it worse by active neglect. North Korea in January of 2003 quite openly pulled the plutonium out of its cooling pools and sent it off to reprocessing. And that's how they got their eight to 12 weapons that they have now, if you believe the sort of consensus estimates. 
we had plenty of time to react to that and deal with it. And we did not because mm -hmm. we were obsessed with the Iraq invasion at the time. Barack Obama looked at North Korea and said, well, they already have nuclear weapons and Iran doesn't. So the payoff in keeping Iran from getting weapons is so much greater than beating your head against the wall on a bet that Kim Jong-un will give up his. You know, I think that's fair to say. But you could end up with a situation where President Obama leaves office in a situation where North Korea is moving from a small number of nuclear weapons to a sizable enough arsenal that they could afford to sell one or two. Hmm. Uh, looking into the future, can we expect any major policies, any practical dimension of the pivot to Asia within the remainder of his time in office? Or is Obama already in the lame duck phase and now we have to look at who's going to be next in the White House? Well, he may be in the lame duck phase, but if you go back over history, you'll discover that many American presidents made many of their biggest foreign policy gains at the end of mm. their time in office, in part because you can do so much more in foreign policy without or around Congress if you are a president than you can, of course, in domestic affairs. So what are the big challenges out ahead? Getting an Iran deal, mm. I think number one in his list. I think North Korea ranks pretty low. I don't think they think there's a lot they can accomplish in the next two years. But trying to draw China in to a web of commitments, international obligations that would moderate its own action is certainly something that the president's going to have to go focus on, and already is. And I think there, that's where the biggest surprise has been. However, I think he's got an opportunity with the Chinese to make some joint progress on North Korea. And I say that because there's very little evidence that Xi Jinping has any particular interest in the North Koreans. Many of his predecessors remembered well from their youth the lips and teeth, you know, rhetoric of, you know, China and North Korea's closeness. They remembered the Korean War. They remembered the shared sacrifice. All that means nothing to Xi. Mm. He looks at North Korea and he sees another big problem on his plate. And I think the only reason that the Chinese have not cut them off is the only thing that sounds worse than dealing with an unruly, bombastic, nuclear-armed, disorganized North Korea <laughs> is dealing with a Republic of Korea and its American ally that could come right up mm -hmm. to the Chinese border if the North collapsed. Uh, with regards to Asia, has will Obama be remembered for anything, so to speak? Nixon has his trip to China. Clinton had the crisis with North Korea already in, in the Taiwan Straits. Will we remember Barack Obama as the man who announced the pivot, or will that fade away eventually? If the pivot is something that turns into reality over the next few years, and the United States really does return to the region if he or returns, never left, but if it does bolster its role in the region, if he gets TPA, mm. if he manages to right the relationship in the uh, space between Japan and South Korea, then I think he will have some significant accomplishments. But, you know, I say in the Confront and Conceal, the book that came out in 2012, mm -hmm. that in the end, 25 years from now, when we're done looking at the question of whether he pulled out of Iraq too early or whether Afghanistan was able to get on his feet or not, I think in the end, how we manage China's rise will be one of the main things that he's measured on. Mm. And he knows it, but I'm not sure he thinks he necessarily has many tools to deal with it right now. Uh, to conclude, David Sanger, in your books, you provide a number of anecdotes about what went wrong during the Bush years with uh, respect to Asia, how America even got the basics wrong. Uh, you quote Bush advisors who referred to the red Chinese uh, and Asian leaders who were afraid of America withdrawing from the region. And you concluded about Obama when he came to office that his job should be undoing the damage of the recent past. Um, and that will take years. Did that work? Not entirely. No, mm. but not entirely for reasons of Obama's fault. I mean, it's one of those imponderables of history that if Kim Jong-il had lived, would he see a reason to take a more reasonable stance here as his father did in his last years? We'll never know the answer to that. It's reasonable to ask, did we significantly underestimate 
the objectives in the region for Xi Jinping when he came in? I think the answer to that is yes, we did. But I don't think that he managed to undo much of the damage. I think that the concern that I hear as I travel around the world is that the Arab states say, we listen to Obama, he just wants to withdraw from the region, he wants to go to Asia, we don't get that. Well, it's not that hard to get. Asia's a growth area for the United States and the Arab states are not. If anything, it's a a drain on diplomatic and military resources for some good reasons, but still a drain. Um, The Europeans look at the pivot to Asia and they say, here's a president who grew up partly in Indonesia, partly in Hawaii, and has very little interest in the traditional old state Atlantic relationships. And I think there's an element of truth to that. The problems that attract him are the hard countries. It's Burma and North Korea and Iran and and, um, so forth. But I think that the amount of actual accomplishment in Asia, particularly in the second term, has been lower than one would have hoped. He had a little more of an A-team on Asia, I think, together in the first term and a little more focus on the region. And I think he felt he could afford that at the time because we had pulled out from Iraq. The Arab Spring seemed underway. Uh, He had a plan to get out of Afghanistan. The second term, he's had to go back into Iraq in a smaller way, but go back in. Same thing for Afghanistan. The Iran negotiations have taken up a lot of time and and, uh, debating issues. My own belief is that, you know, to some degree events conspired against him, but they also didn't sustain the momentum I think they had created for themselves uh, in 2009, 2010. David Sanger, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.